Right, so I'm going to talk about mirror symmetry and Riemann zeta values. Um, I really hope you enjoy it. Uh, all right, th this picture down the bottom here is, uh, is my picture of, um, of mirror symmetry. So I'll explain what it means uh, later on in the talk. I want to start with uh, the, the Riemann zeta values. So we'll start with uh, the Basel problem, uh, which is to, to determine the sum of the reciprocals of square numbers, one over one squared plus one over two squared plus one over three squared, etc. cetera. So first posed around 1650 and uh, studied by uh, Leibniz, multiple Bernoulli family members, um, Goldbach, and they all corresponded with each other and found better and better approximations and so on. And then finally in 1734, Euler gave the, the beautiful uh, correct answer that the, this, ad, this sum adds up to pi squared over six. Um, so more generally, we can ask what is the, the sum of the of one over the one over one to the n plus one over two to the n plus one over three to the n, et cetera. Then in this notation, Euler's theorem can be written as uh, zeta of two equals pi squared over six. And we might wonder uh, what these values are for, for other, what zeta of n is for, for other values of n. But Euler also had something uh, to say about that. He proved an extension of his result in the case that n is an even integer, n equals 2k. And once again, zeta of 2k is equal to some fraction times pi to the 2k. So, and the, the fraction is closely related to the, the Bernoulli numbers. It's a sequence of, of rational numbers. First two non-zero ones are down here. These were discovered independently, almost exactly the same time by Jacob Bernoulli and Seki Takakazu. Um, so these, these numbers zeta of n, uh, uh, very fascinating uh, and appear in all sorts of areas of maths, physics, other areas, as are these Bernoulli numbers, which are also famous for being uh, the subject of the first computer program written by Ada Lovelace to compute Bernoulli numbers. Okay, so, so here's what we, Here's what we know. We, we know zeta of two, zeta of four, zeta of six. We've got this formula due to Euler for them. For the other values, so zeta of one is, is known to, to be infinite. It's also known as the divergence of the harmonic series, first proved by uh, Nicola Rem in the 14th century. And the rest of these zeta values for odd numbers are much more mysterious than the, the even numbers. Zeta of three was proved to be irrational by Roger Appery uh, in 1978, but none of the others, uh, it's not known for, for any of the others whether they're rational or not, although there are results saying that some proportion of them uh, are irrational conjectured to all be irrational, transcendental. Uh, but they're, they're much, just much more mysterious is what I want to say, the zeta of three, zeta of five and so on. All right, so I, I want to forestall a potential um, question that might be in, in your minds. Probably recognize this, this function zeta of s as the Riemann zeta function. So it makes sense if the input is any complex number or you can make sense of it. And it's the subject of the fam famous Riemann hypothesis, which says that the, 
the solutions to zeta of s equals zero either lie at the negative even integers, the trivial solutions, or they lie on this critical line where the real part is a half. So I, I want to be clear that, that that's not what I'm talking about today. We're really interested in these very specific values, zeta of two, zeta of three, values of the zeta function at the positive integers. The subject of Euler's formula, Aperi's irrationality of zeta of three and so on. Okay, so, so the plan for this talk uh, is that I'm going to introduce uh, mirror symmetry, which is a, a deep conjectural relationship between two different types of geometry with its origins in string theory. So this is my picture of mirror symmetry uh, and these two pictures represent the two different types of geometry uh, which it relates. Right, so I'm about to introduce those. Once I've introduced mirror symmetry, I'm going to explain the role that these numbers, zeta of two, zeta of three, zeta of four, and so on, play in mirror symmetry. And then I'm going to explain some recent work joint with uh, these collaborators, Muhammad Abu Zaid, Shil Ganatra, and Hiroshi Iratani which explain how these numbers emerge from the, the geometry in mirror symmetry. So that they, they give some kind of explanation for this, uh, for this emergence of these numbers in terms of geometry. Okay, so let me get started by introducing mirror symmetry, this relationship between two different kinds of geometry. So the first is algebraic geometry, it's one side of the mirror. So an algebraic space is a space defined by algebraic equations or polynomial equations. So an example is space defined by y equals x squared, parabola. Uh, and more generally, you can look at spaces defined by equations like z cubed equals x cubed plus y cubed. So this field has its origins in work of the ancient Greeks, in particular Apollonius on conic sections, which are plane curves defined by quadratic equations, degree two equations, such as which are precisely the shapes you can get by intersecting a plane with a cone. So you can get a circle, an ellipse, parabola or hyperbola. And uh, Apollonius's, or many of uh, Apollonius's works uh, don't survive in, in the ancient Greek. The, they survive through the Arabic translations. And this is, so this is a picture of one of those. So that's the, the picture I'm gonna to use to represent um, uh, algebraic geometry. The other side of the mirror, the other kind of geometry uh, is called symplectic geometry. So a symplectic space is a space endowed with a notion of area of the two dimensional surfaces inside it, or more precisely, a, a closed non-degenerate two form. So it has its origins in classical mechanics around the 1700s. Uh, so, the phase space of a mechanical system, the, the space of all possible uh, positions and momenta of uh, particles in a system uh, is naturally has the structure of a symplectic space. And the rules for how a mechanical system evolves can naturally be de de uh, described in terms of the symplectic geometry of this phase space. But there also exist symplectic spaces that are not the phase space of any uh, mechanical system. 
and studying dynamics in those spaces, uh, more general spaces, symplectic spaces is also a very interesting question. So this is the picture I'm going to use to represent symplectic geometry. It's a painting by Ed Belbruno, who, uh, who uses symplectic techniques to find low energy trajectories, for example, between the Earth and the Moon. So it's a sort of trajectories for a rocket to get from the Earth to the Moon that uh, use less fuel than you would take if you just sort of blasted off and went in a straight line and then had to slow down again at the other end. Um, if you go if you go on a much more loopy path, then then you can use a lot less energy, but it's much more complicated to calculate. And so this is, and and uh, it, it, he's a fascinating guy, and and uh, used these techniques to to save the Japanese mission to the moon, and the fascinating stories that I don't have time to go into. But this is his painting of. Uh, the kinds of trajectories that he that he finds. And I'm going to use that to represent symplectic geometry. Okay, so these old uh, notions of geometry uh, found new applications to, to modern physics, to, to string theory around the 1980s. So I'm, I'm very strongly paraphrasing here, but roughly speaking, Witten explained how, given an algebraic space W, there are some algebraic rules of physics that you can define that particles or strings would satisfy if they lived in, a, in the space W. Similarly, given a symplectic space M, there are some symplectic rules of physics which give rise to symplectic physics in M. And W and M are said to be mirror spaces. If the physics, the algebraic rules of physics in W are equivalent to the symplectic rules of physics in M. So this means if you uh, lived in, if you were made of particles living in a, an algebraic space W, following algebraic rules of physics, or if you lived in symplectic space M and were made of particles, obeying the symplectic rules of physics, you would not be able to distinguish between these two situations. There's no physical experiment you can do to distinguish between these, uh, these two rules of physics, even though the mathematical description of them is very, very different in terms of these very, very different types of geometry. Um, so this is exciting for, for mathematicians because it suggests this, this deep relationship between these two uh, types of geometry. Um, so it, uh, I mean, if, if they give rise to the same physics, it must mean something about the mathematical relationship between them. So you hope that you can use it to get, to, to, to prove things in maths, by, for example, taking some, some problem that you don't know how to solve on one side, then translating it into a new problem on the other side, which you might have a better hope of solving. Right. So actually, I want to be a bit more honest here and say that uh, the, the spaces that we're most interested in which are Kaladi Yao manifolds come equipped with both kinds of geometric structure, and mirror symmetry actually swaps them. So we've got a space W that has both a symplectic structure and an algebraic structure, and another such space M. And the symplectic rules of physics on W are equivalent to the algebraic rules of physics on M. And the algebraic rules of physics on W are equivalent to the symplectic rules of physics on M. Usually we only study one of these arrows at a time, at least mathematicians do. So 
I've been explaining to you that when, when W is mirror to M, then we expect this certain mathematical relationship between the geometries on, on W and M. But in order to, to use that, you know, I really need to know when is when a W and M mirror. Given W, can you know if you give me W, can I can I tell you what is its mirror M that satisfies this relationship? So there are many uh, conjectural examples of mirror pairs W and M, but we certainly don't have a complete list and. Uh, I mean, we, we, certain, we don't even fully understand exactly the full extent of mirror symmetry, which spaces W ought to admit a mirror M. But we can start by looking at the one dimensional case. So there's only one family of Calabi Yau. Sorry, I, I should actually mention all, all these spaces have, uh, have even dimensions. So, so when I talk about a one fold, it actually means it's two dimensional. When I talk about a twofold, that means we're talking about four dimensional spaces. So there's one family of Calabia one folds, and they are the, the tori. So a torus ba basically has to be mirror to another torus like this. They're actually also, with, with the appropriate definition, that there's actually also only one family of Calabia two folds. These are called K3 surfaces. We'll come back to them later. So a K3 surface, a Calabia twofold, is, is mirror to another K3 surface. Um, but the Calabia threefold case is much more interesting. There are there are many, many Calabia threefolds. It's not known if there are finitely many or not. And this this image here was is very famous in the history of mirror symmetry. It was uh, one of the first predictions of mirror symmetry that was mathematically verified, the string theorists sort of set out to write down all of the Calabi Yau threefolds they could, and they plotted them as, as points on this graph. And mirror symmetry would suggest that given a point here corresponding to W, there should be a mirror space M corresponding to uh, a point that's that's flipped around this vertical line. So mirror symmetry predicts that there should be some symmetry around this vertical line in this picture. And at the time, there was no mathematical reason why such a symmetry should exist. So when you look at this plot, it's very evident that, that it does show this strong mirror reflection symmetry. So that was uh, some of the earliest evidence for this conjecture. <coughs> okay, so so I thought maybe this would be the best first place to stop. Are there any questions, Ron? Well, there are no questions, but there's a business proposition. Somebody wants to know if the, your picture of mirror symmetry is for sale. Uh, why don't I say yes? <laughs> Email <laughs> me, we'll agree to a price. Um, okay, so I'll move on then. Um, to, the, to the first real exciting application of mirror symmetry to, to counting problems. So I said that mirror symmetry uh, predicts certain relationships between the algebraic geometry of W and the symplectic geometry of M. So among the relationships it predicts is a relationship between periods of W, which you can think about as like lengths of curves on your space, and some things called gromov witten invariants of M, which are numbers of certain types of objects living on M counts of, of certain objects living on M. So the simplest gromov witten invariant is the number of lines through two points in space. So, so that gromov witten invariant is one. There's, there's precisely one line through two distinct points in space. Another uh, 
more interesting Gromov Witten invariant is the number of lines that lie on a surface in space cut out by a cubic equation, a cubic surface. And that number was determined in 1849 by Cayley and Salmon to be equal to 27, 27 lines on a cubic surface. So that's a more interesting Gromov Witten invariant. So here is yet another. If we let M be a, a quintic threefold, it's a certain Calabi Yau threefold cut out of a four dimensional space by a, a quintic, a degree five equation, then we can define ND to be the Gromov Witten invariant counting the number of degree D curves on N. So N1 is the number of lines on M, similar to the lines on the cubic surface we just saw. And this was determined by Schubert in 1886 to be 2,875. The number of degree two curves or conics was determined a century later by Katz to be 609,250. And that was the state of the art in 1990. And then came this incredible work of Candelas, Della Ossa, Green, and Parks in 1991. So maybe to set the scene for how surprising their work was, let me just say that as far as I understand it, the, the um, consensus in 1990 was that basically the further you went, the harder these numbers ND got to compute. And at some point we were just gonna run out of steam and not bother computing the rest of them. But Candela, Stella, Ossa, Green and Parks gave a beautiful prediction for all of these numbers all at the same time. And they gave, and they explained how they should have a beautiful structure underlying them. And their prediction came from mirror symmetry. So these numbers ND, live over here, the invariants of the symplectic manifold M. So it was already known at the time of their work by work of Green and Plesser, what the, the mirror manifold, mirror space W was supposed to be. So it's a space called the, the mirror quintic. So they translated this problem of computing these numbers ND into a problem about computing periods of this space W. And then they, that was a problem that could be solved. That, that was an easier problem. And they solved it and it gave this incredible prediction for these numbers ND. Um, so that's still a, I mean, it was still a conjecture. Mirror symmetry was not a theorem at that point. It just gave this prediction. Uh, uh, but these were, were proved by Gibbon Tal and Lian Liu Yao in 1996. Okay. And it, so, so this is the point when the mathematical community really sat up and took notice. Uh, that this was a very old problem that wasn't known to have any structure or, or, or interesting answer to it really. And then these string theorists came along and gave this, this incredibly beautiful prediction that fully described the answer and showed it just had this beautiful structure underlying. More recent work on uh, mirror symmetry has, has really been dominated by Kinsevich's homological mirror symmetry conjecture. So, so the idea here is that I, I said that Mirror symmetry predicts certain relationships between an algebraic space W and its mirror symplectic space M. And the idea is that to try to find one statement that somehow encapsulates all of those things that are predicted by mirror symmetry. And Kinsevich suggested that the, the thing we need to get a handle on to understand the, the full mirror symmetry story is, is a category of brains. So he formulated mirror symmetry as saying that if W and M are mirror, then the algebraic category of brains on W, which is called the derived category, 
should be equivalent to the symplectic category of brains on M, which is called the Fukaya category. Okay, and this is, this is what's called a categorification. We're, we're sort of taking something simple like this uh, equality of, of number of these numbers in D with these, this thing you, do, you compute by from the periods of the mirror space W with an equivalence between some more abstract mathematical structure. So, so this picture here is, is what you find if you Google for trying to find an image of, of what is a category. It's, it's some kind of abstract mathematical structure. Um, so this homological mirror symmetry is, uh, is, is a more abstract uh, formulation of what mirror symmetry should mean, but it's vastly more powerful with a lot more structure to it. And that allows for hopefully, ultimately a simpler proof because you have more structure to play with that you can use to prove things. So, so this notion of categorification is, is very pervasive in modern mathematics and it's sometimes treated with kind of ambivalence because I mean, it, it somehow feels a bit sad to take this, this beautiful notion of, of uh, the, these numbers in D, the, you know, these, the, the very concrete statement that we can compute this number of things on one side by doing some computation on the other side and replaces it with something much more abstract. Um, and this ambivalence leads people to compare this, this word categorification with this American slang word californication, which, which refers to the phenomenon of people and, and culture being exported from, uh, from California and kind of messing things up elsewhere. So, so some people think about categorification in, in those terms. Not me. I, I, this, is, this is what I study, this homological mirror symmetry. I, I think it's beautiful. But it does require more investment at the start because it's very abstract. Okay, so this was my next stopping point for questions, Ron. Anything? Questions? No, nothing really. Okay. So now I'm going to move on to the appearance of these, uh, these zeta values that I started with uh, in mirror symmetry. So in this work of Candela, Stella Osser, Green and Parks, we saw that there's supposed to be a relationship between periods, which are invariants of an algebraic space W with gromov witten invariants which are invariants of a symplectic space M. So there's this conjecture of Shinobu Hosono, which gives a more, in some sense, more precise correspondence between uh, these two sides, it gives a, a precise formula for the period in terms of the period on the algebraic geometry side in terms of a certain expression cooked up from the symplectic geometry side. Okay, so let me explain this, con this conjecture. So I mentioned on the previous slide that homological mirror symmetry is formulated as an equivalence between categories of brains. So I I'm going to describe a, a very a uh, special case of Hosono's conjecture because it captures the essence of it and makes the formulae simpler. So I'm going to consider on this side here, I'm going to consider a space filling brain N. So one that lives over the whole space at once. And on this side W, I'm going to consider the corresponding brain under mirror symmetry. I'm going to call that L. And Hosono's conjecture has to do with the period over L, which is this express, which is written like this. So I, I said earlier that you can think about periods as, as lengths of curves. More generally, 
uh, you should think of them as, as something like a volume of L computed with respect to a volume form omega. And this volume form omega naturally depends on a parameter T. And Hosono's conjecture has to do with uh, what this period, the behavior of this period in the limit that T goes to infinity. And it says that we have, we can express it as a polynomial in log T, a n times log t to the n plus blah, 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 down to the constant term a naught plus some lower order terms which go to zero uh, at least as quickly as t inverse, as t goes to infinity. And to Sono's conjectures, we will see. Uh, shows how the zeta values show up in mirror symmetry and they show up in this leading part, the polynomial in log t. They show up in these coefficients, a, a, n, a, n minus one, etc. Now, if you want to compute gromov witten invariants, then you really need to pay attention to these lower order terms. But for the purposes of seeing how the zeta values show up in mirror symmetry, it's this leading order part that we care about. Okay. So what are these coefficients of the, the polynomial that gives the leading order uh, behavior of this period integral? Well, the first one, a n, is just the volume of our symplectic manifold. The next one is zero. So that's not a particularly, uh, that has nothing interesting hiding in it. But then we get, start to get interesting things. A n minus two is equal to zeta of two, which recall is pi squared over six, multiplied by some integral over m, some expression from the, the symplectic manifold. A n minus three is equal to zeta of three times a different integral over m. And in general, the formula for A n minus i involves all products of zeta values where the sum of the inputs is equal to i. So A n minus four would involve zeta of four and zeta of two times zeta of two. A n minus five involves zeta of five and zeta of two times zeta of three and so on. And the conjecture is known to be true in very many cases, although certainly not all. Uh, so the work that I'm gonna describe, which was joint with Abu Zayed, Ganatra and Deratani, doesn't actually give a new proof, a, a proof of this conjecture in any new cases. What it gives is an explanation of why it's true in terms of the geometry of the mirror pairs W and M. So um, it is reasonable, it's very reasonable to hope that the the picture that we've developed, the reason why this conjecture should be true, uh, will allow us to, to prove it more generally uh, in cases where it hasn't previously been proven and where the previous methods will not apply, although it's not something that we have done yet. Okay. So in order to explain how these zeta values show up from the geometry, I need to tell you a bit more about the geometry, the relationship between the geometry of W and the geometry of M. And this is uh, explained by the strominger yao zaslow conjecture from 96. And this says that if W is mirror to M, then there, there exist dual special Lagrangian torus vibrations 
over a common a W and M over a common base B. So we're going to see what that means in examples in a second. But the main import of the conjecture is that it introduces this common base B whose geometry un unites or is sort of intermediate between the geometry, the algebraic geometry of W and the symplectic geometry of N. And the kind of geometry that lives on this base B is, is yet another kind of geometry. It's called tropical geometry. And it looks quite different from algebraic geometry and symplectic geometry. It's more about piecewise linear things like, uh, like polyhedra and so on. Um, so, so it raises the, the possibility that we can ultimately relate algebraic geometry of W, symplectic geometry of M by an intermediate step involving tropical geometry of B. And, and this is the, the approach that we use to understand Persono's conjecture. So let's see an example of this stromager yao zaslow conjecture. The very simplest example is where the base B and the fiber, the tori, that fiber over it, that are the fibers over it, are one dimensional. So here the fiber is a one torus, which is just a circle. And the base is also a circle. So here's the base, is our circle down here. There's our fiber, which is a one torus, a circle. And to get our space W, we put a fiber, a circle over every point in the base. And together they sweep out the surface of a donut, two torus. Now, the stromager yao zaslow conjecture says that in order to get the mirror space M, we should take every fiber of W, every one of these circles, and replace it with the dual circle. Now, the dual of a circle is another circle. So in this case, you end up with another two torus. Uh, and, and it doesn't really look like anything very exciting is happening, but that, that's because we're in a very low dimensional case. But we end up seeing that the two torus should be mirror to the two torus, which was the very first example we saw of mirror Calabi L1 folds. Now, what does Hosono's conjecture look like in this case? It says we should take the space filling brain on M and take the mirror brain on W, which in this case is this circle that I've drawn in blue and called L. So it's a circle that intersects each fiber precisely once. So here, this blue dot is where it intersects the fiber I drew. Tosono's conjecture is about computing the period over L, over this brain L. And in this case, it just says that it's equal to the length of the circle, length of the base, multiplied by log t. So it's not very interesting. There's no zeta values, and that's because the dimension is too low for them to report. OK. Let's move up a dimension. So now our base is going to be a two-sphere. The fiber is going to be a two-torus. So we're going to take, we're going to put a two torus over every point in our two dimensional sphere. And we're going to construct a four dimensional space W. Two dimensions coming from the fiber, two dimensions coming from the base. And this four dimensional space is called a K3 surface. This is the explanation in case you're interested behind the name. Now, the complication that arises in this case is that some of the fibers, some of these torus fibers get pinched. So there are 24 points in our two sphere. 
over which instead of a two torus like this, we have a two torus where a certain circle has been squeezed down to zero. Right, so there are 24 points like that. Now, what is the brain that's mirror to the space filling brain? It's again a, 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 a well, it's a two dimensional surface inside our four dimensional space, which intersects each fiber precisely once. So I've drawn with blue dots the two points where this brain intersects the two fibers that I drew. So this is analogous to this case here, where it intersected each circle fiber once. All right, so that's our L that we want to compute the period of, which is the volume with respect to this volume form omega. So the first term in the expansion is unsurprising. It's just the area of the base. And you can see why that should appear, because basically it's this looks like just another copy of the of the base two sphere. But then there's an extra term, which is where zeta of two appears. And it, it appears exactly 24 times, which suggests that zeta of two is somehow appearing uh, as, as sort of extra correction terms associated to these pinched fibers. Finally, well, this is the last case I'm going to do. Um, we can talk about Calabi Yau three folds, where the base is a three sphere, which I've drawn as a solid gray ball. You can think about removing a point of infinity from the, the three sphere to get this ball. And the fiber is a three dimensional torus. But once again, some of the fibers get pinched. So there's, there's this kind of network uh, sitting inside our three sphere. And over the, the edges in this network, our torus fiber gets pinched, similar to what happened in the previous example. And over the vertices, these, these points where edges meet, it gets even more pinched, the fiber looks even more singular and uh, non-smooth than the fiber looked in the previous example. So here's what Hassona's conjecture looks like. In this case, it says that the period of the brain L, the leading term looks like the volume of the base once again. The next term, is zeta of two times the total length of this network. And finally, we have zeta of three times the number of vertices, which is four in this case. And then we have lower order terms. So you can see once, you can see once again that it really looks like the zeta of two comes from these, this sort of one dimensional bit. So it's co-dimension two, because it's something one-dimensional living inside a three-dimensional thing. And zeta of three comes from the co-dimension three bit, which are these vertices. All right, this was my final stopping point for questions before I make the final dash for the finish. Is there anything wrong? Well, this time we do have quite an accumulation of questions. Let me pick up okay. a few of them. So uh, in Hosono's conjecture, you have two parameters, T and N. And people who are asking, what do they mean? I assume that N is the dimension of the Calabiao, but what is T? Uh, so, uh, what's the best way to say it? The, maybe the, the best thing to say is that really we aren't just looking at uh, one geometric structure on our one symplectic structure on M and one algebraic structure on uh, W. Really, we're looking at a family of such structures which are parameterized by T. 
And this limit as t goes to infinity, it's also known as the, the large, large volume limit on M, the large complex structure limit on W. Um, and this is a natural part of, of mirror symmetry. So, so really we're, we're studying this period integral in a certain limit um, as, the, as the geometric structures vary parameterized by T. Any other questions? Well, the, um, there are a number of questions that are very general, so maybe I'll keep those for the end. But another specific question is, why do a finite number of fibers get pinched? In other words, why does 24, where does 24 come from? And a related question is, how, how much worse does the tori the get pinched over the isolated points? Those are, uh, I'm, I'm not sure how to give a good answer to, to the first one. Um, I, mean, I mean, you can, I mean, it's, it, I mean, it's, it's something that you can, uh, hey, this is not a good answer. You, I mean, you, you, you can just sort of compute uh, and in, I mean, you start with, start with it from a certain characterization of what a K3 surface has. Well, maybe I can say, you can see it from the shape of the, an invariant called the homology of a K3 surface that it couldn't possibly look like uh, just all smooth two tori living over a two sphere. That, that space would, would just, it's, it, this invariant called the homology would just look wrong. It couldn't possibly be a K3 surface. And you can try to compute what the homology would have to look like uh, if K of the fibers were pinched and you only get the right answer if you pinch 24 of them. Uh, I'm sorry, that's not a very good, good answer. I'm not sure how to do better. And the question about these pinched three tori I mean, well, I maybe I can say that a three torus, you can think about a three torus as taking a cube and uh, identifying the opposite sides of the cube. And in order to get these pinched tori over the edges, you should take one face of the cube and pinch it down to a point similar to what we did here. We took a circle and pinched it down to a point. Now we're going to take a face of the cube and pinch it down to a point. And for these even more pinched tori, we need to take a more complicated configuration that sort of looks like a, um, you sort of take a, a shape that looks like a, two points connected by three lines inside one face, and then you sweep it along so that it looks, there are sort of three wings coming out from, from a, a line moving along your three torus, and then you need to take that whole configuration and pinch it down to a point. So, actually, so, so you're pinching something more complicated is the, base, is the upshot. So to be honest, there are actually two different kinds of vertices and two different kinds of pinched uh, Tori that live over them, and I only described one of them, but hopefully that gives an idea. Okay, so were there more, or, or was that? Well, yes, we're getting quite a lot of questions. So, um, depending on how you're doing on time, I can ask as many more as you want, or we can defer that those to the to the Q and A at the end. Uh, it might be better to to defer them, um, and uh, and and we we can cover them at the end then. Sure. Okay, so now I'm gonna move on to how do we, so, so I've, I've said that it, it looks like, it looks like 
zeta of two is kind of living over these edges and zeta of three is living at these vertices. But how do we actually see that? I'm gonna show you sort of how, the, how these numbers actually showed up in our computations. So it's based, as I said, on this stromager yao zaslow conjecture which says that intermediate between the algebraic geometry of W and the symplectic geometry of M, we have this tropical geometry of the base of the SYZ vibration, stromagy yao zaslow vibration. And this is the really crucial one. We're really trying to compute a period which lives in this algebraic geometry world. So the really crucial step is to understand this relationship between the algebraic world, world and the tropical world. Things that are defined by polynomials and things that look sort of piecewise linear. And the basis for that relationship is this limit here, known as Maslow dequantization. So it says the limit as t goes to infinity, log t of t to the x plus t to the y is equal to the maximum of x and y. And the reason this holds is if x is the biggest between x and y, so max of x, y equals x, then t to the x is much, much bigger than t to the y and dominates this, this term here. And that implies that log base t of this thing is close to log base t of just t to the x which is x, which is the max. So that's roughly the, the explanation behind this, uh, this limit. So let me show you an example of this limit in action relating something from the world of algebraic geometry to something from the world of tropical geometry. So let's look at this function p of a equals a inverse plus one plus t inverse a. So if I substitute in t to the x for a and take log base t of it, that's equal to log base t of t to the minus x plus t to the zero plus t to the x minus one. And Maslow dequantization says that as t goes to infinity, this converges to the max of the exponents, minus x, zero, and x minus one. So here in blue, I've drawn this, the graph of this function, the max of minus x. So this is the region where minus x is bigger than zero or x minus one. So the function is equal to minus x. This is the region where zero is the biggest of these three functions. And this is the region where x minus one is biggest of these three functions. And this approximation says that this log of p of t to the x, which whose graph I've drawn in red, converges to the, the piecewise linear blue graph as t goes to infinity. So we're trying to use this approximation to compute these period integrals. So the kind of computation that shows up is trying to compute the area under the graph of a function like this. So this is the kind of thing that shows up in our period integral. So we approximate it by this piecewise linear thing, but then there's one error term which in this case is equal to two times zeta of two over log t, and then all the other terms are lower order. And this, this error term comes precisely from the loci where this function bends and the red, the graph of the red function can't quite stay as, as close to it, to the blue function. Um, and so you can, you can look at more general functions than this, and you'll end up with, if the function has k bends, then you'll get a correction term of k times zeta of two over log t. So each bend contributes this zeta of two term. And this is 
analogous to this situation here, the pinched fibers give rise to bends in our function and each one gives rise to this zeta of two as some kind of small correction to it. If you want, I mean, this is a computation you can actually do if you, if you, this is the integral you need to do. And if you expand this out as a Taylor series, you'll, you'll be able to see why this holds. Finally, with zeta of three, let, let's see an example with zeta of three. So now we need a function with two variables. And we take this function here. We do the same thing as before. We look at log of pt of t to the x, t to the y. That's our algebraic geometry function. And this is our tropical geometry function. It's the max of these linear functions. So this function is equal to zero over this triangle here, x minus one in this region, y minus one in this region, and minus x minus y minus one in this region. So if I draw the graph of this piecewise linear function, it's flat over this triangle, and then it bends upwards on these other three regions. And our approximation says that uh, the graph of the red function gets closer and closer to this blue function as t goes to infinity. So once again, we want to use this approximation to compute these period integrals. So we're going to try to integrate this red function over a region U, which looks something like this. And the leading order term is just gonna be the integral of this piecewise linear function but then we get some correction terms. The first one is zeta of two over log t times the total length of this blue shape, the triangle with three legs coming out of it, that lives inside the region U. And that you can see by imagining doing the integral, first integrating in the direction perpendicular to one of these legs and the difference between the blue and red graphs is going to look exactly like it did on the previous slide. We've got a little difference between the blue and red graphs. And we integrate in this perpendicular direction and we get zeta of two. Then we integrate along the leg and we get this factor of the length. And finally, each vertex contributes a factor of zeta of three over log t squared. Um, and that's another explicit integral that, that, you, can, uh, that you can do, that you can solve. Uh, and so more generally, if we had, we, we might get a function that was more complicated, and the answer would still be the same. We would have some kind of complicated uh, configuration, piecewise linear configuration in here. And the integral would be equal to this zeta of two term times the total length of the, the bend locus of our function plus the total number of vertices times zeta of three over log t squared. So that's how these numbers showed up, uh, show up in our, um, our perspective on the Sonos conjecture.